I'd like to share a story with you that a friend of mine used to tell people. It starts with an elderly couple taking a walk down a beach in the tropics while on holidays very early one morning. There had been a storm but the night before, and as a couple walked, they saw in the very distance, a distance, a small child who appeared to be throwing, picking something up and throwing it in the water. As they approached and got closer, they saw this young boy and he was actually picking starfish up off the beach and throwing them back into the sea. They approached the boy and the old man said somewhat sternly to the child, son, what are you doing? The boy said, sir, I'm trying to throw these starfish back into the water before the sun comes up and kills them where they lay on the sand. The gentleman said somewhat sarcastically to him, son, there are thousands of starfish on this beach and there are thousands of beaches in this world just like this where starfish wash up every morning. Do you really think you're going to make any difference? At that moment, the boy was holding a particularly large starfish in his right hand. He looked down at his hand and with all his might, he wound up and threw that starfish as far back as he could into the water and said politely and respectfully to the gentleman, for that, star, for that starfish, sir, I think I made a difference. With all the chaos going on in the world, between the global pandemic, Ukraine, and everything else going on, it's very easy to be nihilistic and think, what possible difference could I make in this world as an individual? So I'm here today to tell you what my plan for you is tonight. Uh, going back as far as um, 2013, there was a program designed by the NAN First Nations Chiefs in northeast western Ontario to address the epidem uh, epidemic of opioid overdose and death that was going on and ravaging their communities. I'm often asked as a physician, medicine physician, by my friends and colleagues, how can you do with this work? How can you possibly work with this population? In 2015, I was lucky enough to be invited as a small group of physicians who would travel up north matched with one of the incredibly skilled and dedicated physicians who flew out of Sioux Lookout to 14 northern communities. So in this case, the map shows where we flew. So we flew from Sudbury through Sioux Lookout up to this tiny community. And these programs were designed so that people had identified that they wanted help with their addiction and up to three months in advance would sign up for the program and then simply wait for the doctors to come to town. As part of the program, we encouraged them back in the old days to stop their opiates some 48 hours before the doctor arrived. Within hours, this will trigger an opiate withdrawal syndrome, which is extremely unpleasant, causing a dysphoria, depressed mood, and physical illness, very similar to a terrible flu, where you get nausea, vomiting, cold sweats, bone ache, goose flesh, it's extremely unpleasant. When we meet the, uh, the residents, we meet them as a group. It's very different, large city methadone clinics. And we'd greet them and have a celebration. As part of the celebration, we would quickly meet with them and start them on a pill that somebody's going to talk about later tonight, I think called Suboxone. Within hours to days, this transforms their lives. They go from malnourished, pale, feeling like death personified, and they start to feel much better. We do individual counseling and we do indigenous healing circles for the group to deal with some of their issues and their traumas. We also feed them because they're almost all malnourished because this addiction is extremely expensive in these remote communities. They spend everything they have on getting these drugs and maintaining their habit. So at one day after we'd finished the meal and the cleanup, which is part of the chores that everybody's assigned, I was sitting by myself, just taking a few notes, and I noticed a tiny little young woman sitting on a beat-up couch. As I approached her, I asked her, is it okay if I sit with you? And without averting her gaze from the floor, she shrugged her shoulders and said, sure. I sat down and asked her what her name was. She told me her name was Amber. I said to her, Amber, that's a beautiful name. Do you know what it is? She did not. Being a bit of a science geek and a former geologist in a former life, I went on to give her a fairly detailed explanation of what Amber is. I told her, that's interesting, Amber is actually a beautiful semi-precious stone. 
in which either buds or other materials become incorporated in tree sap. That tree falls over, is buried, and that sap is fossilized and turned into a gemstone. Amber was thoroughly unimpressed with my scientific explanations <laughs> of the origin of amber. So that was going nowhere. And Nick said to Amber, Amber, I can't help but notice how sad you look. Again, she didn't look up. And with my comment, I noticed that her chin was quivering ever so slightly. So I asked her, what makes you so sad? Amber explained to me that to be part of this program, the clients had agreed to sequester for up to 21 days in these remote cabins where we were seeing them. But it was four days away from Halloween. She had saved up her money and sewn a special costume for her four-year-old son and had hoped to take him out for his first Halloween trick-or-treating night. She wasn't going to be able to do that. Demonstrating my incredible lack of insight and my inability to abandon the line of questioning once initiated, something that my daughter and wife are not surprised by, by I persisted. So he said, Amber, is there anybody else who can take your son out trick-or-treating? She said, no. She barely made eye contact with me. So I said to Amber, what about your mother? Amber told me her mother had fallen into the water in Fort Severn and frozen to death and died when Amber was only seven. I pressed on. I said, Amber, what about your father? She told me when she was 11, her nephew had accidentally discharged a weapon and uh, shot and killed her father when she was 11. I went on and said, what about your boyfriend? She told me my boyfriend is currently in jail awaiting sentencing for attempted murder. In fact, the only responsible adult who could possibly take her child out trick-or-treating was her boyfriend's mother. As bad luck would have it, that night the uh, pump failed and it was a couple of hundred meters offshore, so we had no running water. We had 24 people in the program who were acutely unwell with diarrhea, vomiting, profuse sweating. And so we had an emergency meeting with the elders and the decision was made that we should transport people a few at a time into the community where they could go to the local church, shower and do their laundry. We also decided that we could do that on Halloween and which would allow them the chance to engage in a healthy family activity, take the kids out trick or treating. So the night after I'd seen Amber, I went back to my cabin. I was doing my charting and writing my notes and I had a bit of an epiphany. What struck me is that based on my interactions with the other patients, there was absolutely nothing unique about Amber's multiple, what we call adverse childhood experiences, and that virtually everybody in that program came from a similar background. I had done some research before I headed up north the first time, and I was shocked to read stats that somewhere between 60 and 80% of people in remote First Nations communities are affected by either substance use disorders or mental health related issues or both. My epiphany was that 100% of people are not affected in light of the fact that Amber's experience was not at all unique. A few months later, I was lucky enough to spontaneously, on a return trip to the same community, I ran into Amber and her now, now five-year-old son. I was completely gobsmacked by the transformation of Amber. Her skin color had transformed completely. She looked healthy. She gained some weight and her eyes were alive and, and full of life. She also was a very attentive and loving mother to her now five-year-old son. I invited them into the exam room where I was working and within five minutes, this little boy with his adorable chubby cheeks was coloring all over the bed and the walls and completely dismantling my exam room. <laughs> she was extremely pleasant with him. And so, on the long flight home from the reserve, I was reflecting on, I was reflecting on my experience with Amber. And it occurred to me, this is why I do this work in response to my friend's question. So my comment to you that Amber is my starfish. Who could be your starfish? What difference could you make in somebody's life? Thank you very much. <laughs>